Now, let me introduce my panelists. We have Fleming Shi, Chief Technology Officer at Barracuda Networks. He's beaming in all the way from California and he's not beaming in from Area 51. <laughs> Fleming is a software engineer and is here to tell us about key innovations, developments that is resulting as the shift in attitudes towards security occurs. Next, we have Dr. Paul Lothian, uh, Director for Cyber at KPMG. He's joining us from sunny Singapore. Paul has a mix of vendor and consultancy background, and today he will help us to navigate the trends around borderless security. So Fleming and Paul, let me start with you, Fleming. Sure. Set the scene. Hmm. Let's start by finding out what's really happened before and after COVID. What changed? How did it affect the security context? Definitely. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity. Great to meet everyone. Uh, so, you know, as you know, before COVID, before uh, the pandemic, um, there are a lot of digital transformation already taking place, right? So uh, the utilization of public cloud, uh, getting workloads into public cloud, and actually building native applications served from public cloud all over the world, it was a huge trend already. Uh, actually, we did a study that a lot of the organizations are already if not uh, fully in production, but very likely in the near future, uh, we'll, we'll be using public cloud as sort of the core network. So that they will start their uh, application building and their resources from the public cloud then building out to potentially to their existing uh, data centers. So it's quite a shift. So I was really interested in that area because uh, in fact, uh, public cloud utilization created a boom of uh, uh, you know, you, you can see how Azure is doing from Microsoft as well as how Amazon has, has been doing. So this boom is really coming from the developers. If you think about the developer persona, persona um, they're very different from the, uh, the security persona. So what they have done is they started making uh, their software in public cloud. They started utilizing native features. And uh, the security guys are like, okay, you're moving fast, you're building fast, how do I secure you now? So there's a, a, there's a special, uh, you know, a set of uh, a protection we call the cloud uh, security posture management to make sure the developers are actually doing things correctly in the cloud. So before the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic, it was a lot of cloud migration, making sure people are doing things correctly, securely, moving fast. Um, then pandemic hits, right? So when that happened, we saw, you know, beyond cloud really is now home networks, right? Now you have to rely on your home networks as part of your organization to get people connected. So that, you know, not every home networks is a, is a fortress, let's just put it that way, right? There's usually lack of security or maybe even, uh, you know, insecure passwords or, um, you know, I have seen people using the default password from the modem, even though it's hashed, but it's still easily uh, obtainable. So my point there is, now the, the dispersion is no longer just about the, uh, the application service. It's also about interconnecting people, file sharing, Zoom. You guys remember uh, the Zoom bombs came out. You guys remember people just jump into your Zoom, right? <laughs> they had to fix a few things. So the, the realization of how people work together um, in order to, you know, to protect that, the perimeter really has been really completely dispersed. And I know we still have offices. I know in Asia, the pandemic is in maybe in a better phase than where we are in America, right? But I have to say, uh, uh, you know, a lot of offices are still not open in America. So people are still working from home primarily. So think about the scenario of protecting every user and your assets from home all the way to your public cloud infrastructure, right? One of the most critical infrastructure you have to protect. So it's mind boggling. So the difference is it's uh, very apparent to me as far as before and after. So the users or how they interact with your environment, uh, the trust-based kind of uh, you know, policies you have to set to make sure uh, you have the right people interacting with your assets and resources, it's becoming a key element. Yeah. 
I mean, that's a good point. Um, let me pick your brain and I'll bring Paul uh, to also mm -hmm. add his viewpoints. But Fleming, when you talk to a lot of your customers and other enterprises who are going through the shift, do you see a mindset shift among CISOs as well as the chief security officer's uh, office? Sure. Um, in fact, um, let me let me cover in the same limelight as you kind of started, you know, before COVID and after COVID, right? So even before COVID, the mindset for the security uh, teams, uh, let it be CISOs and uh, decision makers who are building the infrastructure, they're already shifting to a di uh, direction uh, of actually shift left. Well, you know, you probably heard this phrase before, where left is where developers are starting to build their software. How do you protect them at the moment they're writing their code? Because code is no longer just the logic you put in the software. Code now drives infrastructure. You guys know that infrastructure as code is one of the ways to automate all this powerful public cloud environments to actually be able to, uh, to bring out the awesome uh, you know, resources. So, so that is really important. This is why CSPM is an important um, aspect of their uh, you know, security uh, uh, posture because they have to look at how the developers are interacting with the public cloud. Are they securing their keys? Are they, are they spinning up um, you know, basically environments without uh, certain security measures? Are they actually sending uh, the telemetries and events so a, a SIM product or SOAR product can actually watch over? Right, so that's before COVID. After COVID, it's like, you know, we, you know, many years ago, I, I, you know, I also uh, met with people and talked about zero trust as a, a way to think about security. And that time is about overlays on your existing VPN networks, right? Overlays. They call it software-defined software-defined perimeters. But now zero trust actually takes a new meaning. Zero trust means conditional, contextual. Uh, posture on your endpoint before it actually have access to a SaaS um, application. Uh, obviously, in order to access your VPN and infrastructure, your true network infrastructure, uh, it's, a, it's a also a considerable amount of, uh, 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 you know, consideration for, uh, uh, for, for the CISOs. So definitely very important. CSPM and Zero Trust, they're kind of coming all together now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Paul, uh, your your viewpoints. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good, good morning, everybody, and uh, yeah, greetings from uh, from uh, Singapore. So, so I think yeah, I mean, you know, if, if we look at the before and the after, there's, there's no doubt that uh, organisations were on the digital journey, and then you know they they, they had to um, jump fully digital uh, into cloud. You know, probably pretty fast. Um, some decisions or you know expand there their uh, connection infrastructure, uh, leverage cloud, you know, go to go to SaaS solutions for email, you know, uh, the Zoom story was mentioned, right? There's many other stories. I think what we see from our, you know, security perspective with, with our clients in that scenario is, is that, you know, the reality is that some of the security teams aren't always at the table, you know, uh, in these moves, right? It's just, we have to keep the lights on, keep things going. Um, so that was, you know, the, maybe the during uh, so, so now in the after or, or, or towards the after, you know, we're seeing companies looking back and then having to, you know, um, kind of tighten up and review their, their you know, work from home infrastructures. Um, you know, a lot of them increase their controls, you know, particularly around the identity and access management and monitoring, um, you know, as, as, as we went through this uh, transition. So heightened, heightened level, um, heightened controls, um, basically because, you know, um, you have this technology change going on super fast, uh, and then you also have the, you know, the bad guys. So they're they're always looking to make a buck uh, somewhere. And and actually, you know, the reality is they don't care if it's a COVID or world, you know, health emergency. They just uh, they're out there and they were out there before it. Um, you know, with uh, social engineering and, and and ransomware, all that stuff. And you know, they they they, they pick on whoever health or education. You know, um, they used to pick on the banks a lot because you know, their 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 defenses are now. Uh, much better, but better being on the journey. <clears throat> so they go for the, you know, the other the other sectors that they can. Um, and I'm sure, you know, the the COVID situation just really, you know, is, is a heightened um, sense of urgency. So so the, you know, any social engineering and ransomware attacks are, 
you know, they're, they're based on creating that sense of urgency with people, you know, because they need to do something, they need to respond to a, a medical advisory, they need to pick up some, some medical thing or, or they, they, you know, something of that nature and it causes them to click a link and then boom, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's, the, that's, you know, that's the start. Um, so I think that's definitely what we, we saw. And then, you know, uh, the campaigns, you know, uh, traditional campaigns and the message from the, the chief financial officer to, to act and to do something, you know, those continued. Um, I certainly saw, you know, personally, the, the amount of Amazon or <clears throat> home deliveries, you know, the, the amount of Amazon, um, you know, emails and, uh, and texts or, or, or UPS deliveries, you know, the, you know, the phishing definitely increased. Um, so we really, really, we saw this, you know, kind of compounded, uh, you know, fast technology change uh, along with, you know, the, the, um, you know, the exploitation of the si situation, you know, by the, uh, you know, by the attackers. Mm -hmm. Good one, Paul. Uh, a quick one before I move on to Fleming. Uh, when you looked at all the attacks, and I'm sure everybody and media like us have been reporting that it's like a, a millions of attacks that's going on right after a crisis. And crisis always... Um, introduces more attacks. But do you see sophistication of these attacks going up? Or are these amateurs who are trying to be the next ransom making a quick buck? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. So the, so the way the attacks kind of evolve, you know, what was, what was advanced, uh, you know, five years ago is, is commodity today because there's automated tools. Uh, you can go on the dark web and buy, buy kits, uh, you know, for $100,000, uh, whatever. So, so the so the sophistication and maturity of the attacks can be executed by 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 lower skilled you know, individuals. Um, I think the reality is you've got a spectrum of of, of attackers out there from you know uh, that you know that what they called the script kiddies years ago who are just having a go. You know you've you've got activists who are maybe politically uh, or environmentally you know oriented uh, to make a statement. You have the cyber criminals, of course, right? They're looking to monetize steal records and sell, you know, sell the data on the dark web or, or extortion, you know, um, ransomware. Um, and then you've got like the really good guys who are the, who are the, uh, you know, maybe the nation state, state sponsor type things. And, and basically you're never going to be able to defend against them because they've got so much, uh, you know, firepower and, uh, you know, um, technique. And often they, they operate totally below the, the radar as well. Uh, and, and they're targeting you know, nation states or the, you know, um, uh, defense agencies, aerospace agencies, uh, state secrets, uh, you know, um, you know, designs, designs, manufacturing, all that type of thing, um, you know, where there's significant, you know, potentially economic impact. So you have this like spectrum of, you know, of attackers. Um, I think the ones we saw the most, the most of, were, you know, the, the, the cyber criminals and the, you know, the ransomware, really, that's the ones that really, uh, I think, hit the, hit the headlines most in this uh, COVID situation. Okay, good one. And Fleming, you wanted to add yes. to that? Yes, yes, actually. Um, in fact, we did a couple uh, publications between March and May related to the threats that's been out there. So, you know, just as Paul mentioned, the bad guys don't really care if it's a pandemic or a you know, political crisis. They just want to take advantage of it. So the impersona impersonation um, actually is pretty severe. They were attacking a lot of actually medical, uh, you know, community, right, as well as the educational community. You guys know one of the ransom attacks in uh, UCSF uh, amounted to uh, close to 1.5 million, 1.6 million dollar payout, uh, and also some of the impersonation was impersonating WHO actually, uh, and uh, the 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 threat actually once it gets onto your system, it it. It, it, it tries to basically brute force into your browser uh, password files. Because you know sometimes when you're using browser, you save your password, right? It brute forces that. And try to actually, uh, it links up with your uh, decryption libraries on your system and do all those things. So the bad, bad guys will just take advantage of the pandemic. So hence why, uh, you know, the, the endpoint solutions are going to be really necessary to, to protect the users. Uh, they don't have a parameter to help them all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and obviously training is always important too. Make sure the users are uh, better trained, uh, you know, understand the difference between uh, a phishing attack and a legitimate email is really, really critical. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. So there's, if you guys want some samples in the future, I can show them to you. <laughs> it's uh, a <laughs> it's pretty, uh, pretty, Pretty gnarly, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Thanks, mm -hmm. Fleming. And I, I heard uh, it's a lot of this ransomware. Now the biggest problem is for the criminals to actually take out the money because changing cryptos into fiat currency is now becoming a challenge as uh, agencies are working together. But that's another discussion altogether. Yeah. Uh, that, this part, I would like to focus on Fleming. Why? Because mm -hmm. he's a solution provider and reporters like us like to ask questions to solution providers. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> mm -hmm. we've been talking a lot about traditional approach to security and how people have to change their mindset. Now for CISOs, how do they start doing security in a borderless environment? Where should they focus on? Right. So if you think about uh, actually everything related to your network, it's about the data. A lot of times is where your data lives, right? So if you think about the perimeters that used to be there, it's a firewall in front of your, your network or sometimes in front of your server farm. Uh, but now if you think about what's really necessary is that workloads are in the thousands and they're instrumented and orchestrated uh, really drastically, uh, dynamically, um, based on uh, uh, infrastructure's code. So this, this security officer should be looking at uh, where does the data live? Uh, the data for customers, do they live in some S3 bucket? I just go right to it, right? You know, you probably have a bunch of web application components in front of it. You have load balancers, everything else, but at the end, your data sits maybe in a database, but could be, uh, you know, database dump into an S3 bucket, for example, right? So you guys heard of all sorts of nightmare stories back in the days, you know, S3 bucket gets breached and everything goes bad, right? So the point there is uh, understand where your data live, understand your uh, infrastructure, how do, they, uh, how do they actually grow and shrink based on your needs. Of course, uh, Internally, if you already have, uh, you know, various different controls for SOC, you know, various different control, uh, those are already in place, but you want to now understand how it applies to the new offerings you have, new exposures you have. So start from there. Now, now obviously, you're going to have uh, devices running virtual form factors, running Kubernetes con containers, could be also uh, software running uh, completely serverless in the cloud. And you could also have, uh, you know, data that's basically being shared among your employees on your laptops, right? So, so those are the areas to, to, to start tracing your data, understand how big your infrastructure, not necessarily where the parameter is, is how they are actually being used. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, whether f for disaster recovery purposes, uh, obviously backup and restore is good, but encryption is really important. So, I think Paul mentioned something about extortion earlier, about data breach. Uh, the ransomware attacks these days are no longer just one, one payment. They go ask for the second payment. The second payment is like, sir, you, I give you the key, you open your file. Guess what? I have a copy too. I can actually expose your data if you don't pay me the second time, right? That is really bad. If you think about it, if you encrypt your data, find a way to secure it, they cannot do that to you, um, easily at least. So, so anyway, so I think those are the uh, things I will say, uh, think about your data, understand where they live, you know, uh, and the infrastructure as code is really, really important. So shift left is understanding how builders and developers are, and, and DevOps are, are, are playing with your infrastructure all the time. Yeah. Okay. Good one. And uh, I'd like to bring up a poll question at this moment, as we are looking at how we are looking to invest in security. Jim, could we have the poll question up? Does everybody see a poll question? Not yet. There you oh, go. Okay. Yeah. See it now. <laughs> okay. It's a simple question. I and mean, we just wanted to see how the audience thinks. How is your company investing in security after COVID-19? And we'll dive into that subject right after this. But I'd like to hear from you guys or the audience where they see themselves. And for those who are not in the security area per se, there is always the last option.
So Paul, while we wait for the results, I'm just wanting to know uh, uh, your thoughts on just now what Fleming was talking about in terms of shift left and the developer environment itself, and also how CISOs need to think about where the data sits. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, maybe I'll take the second question first about, you know, the CISO view. So, so I think all oh, the CISOs that, you know, we, we work with, um, you know, <clears throat> they're, they're juggling a lot of different things, right? Um, so they're, they're, they're trying to secure the legacy for, for, for sure, right? And then they've got these technology changes going on and changing uh, threat profile. Um, they've probably also got new, new products and innovations that they need to, to be at the table with and, and, and secure. Um, I mean, I think the reality is the perimeter has been opening up for years. Um, you know, as organizations have extended supply chains, uh, there's remote access for employers, employees that we talked about, uh, also the supply chain and vendors. So that's something that's, that's always been a, a challenge, not just from a tech perspective, but from a process and governance perspective. And, and so a lot of the folks that we um, work with, you know, uh, third party access has been, you know, particular focus uh, in some of these, in some of these programs. Um, Back to the, you know, the data point, <clears throat> I think there's increased focus. You know, a few years ago it was let's secure the infrastructure um, and then that moved on to let's try and secure the applications, our critical applications. Now it's really going right to the top of the stack with the data, um, knowing the critical assets, the crown jewels, as they say, and, you know, not just tech focused, but, you know, if, if we're doing, if I'm a tech company, for example, uh, and I'm doing M&A for the next phase of growth uh, and revenue, the CEO lens, you know, um, you know, I want to protect my deal data, what I'm offering for the, for the potential merger acquisition and the processes around that. So, so we're seeing a shift, um, you know, there uh, as well. And then, you know, the cloud side, as folks going to multi-cloud, really, not just single clouds, but they're, they're in a multi-cloud, they might have 20, 30 clouds, you know, plus. Um, and depending what, what type of clouds you're going to, um, you know, you still have data as data security as a responsibility with the encryption and tokenization still have identity and access management, who's got access to that data. Um, and then if you're going more to the PaaS platform as a service type models, then you've got you know, responsibility on the, uh, some of the platform aspects as well. Um, so, so you've still got, as, as, a, as an organization, the security uh, responsibility. Um, and I think what, we, what we're seeing really is, is that, you know, um, in these SaaS models, the review of the cloud security configurations are, are, are uh, really important because some of the, you know, the big cloud providers, you know, um, they provide the security tools, but you've got to turn them on. And if you don't turn them on, or you don't know how to turn them on, then you're you're open, and then your S3 bucket, you know, is, is in the in the press. Right? That's that's what, uh, what we see quite a lot of. That, that's true, Paul. Um, a lot of people seems to um, do not know that they actually have the tools. <laughs> it's one of those issues. Um, could we have the results? Ah, so this is interesting. So we have a tie. So. Uh, in terms of investments in security, we have 20% uh, who's saying slightly more than before uh, COVID-19. And there are some who's saying less than before as we are reallocating funds. Um, although I would disregard the 40% who say you should ask my CISO. <laughs> I guess a lot of people took that option <laughs> to stay away, but I have to, wanted to give you that option anyway. So. Talk about these results, uh, Fleming. Hmm. You see slight increase in investment as well as reallocation of funds. Right time to invest? You would think, I guess, everybody is talking about security now. Um, I think if you look at what happened, I would just use a, a little bit of uh, my own story, right? So in Barracuda, um, in March, we had to all work from home. So guess what happened? We have to... Uh, make sure everyone has a laptop, right? Uh, that spend was a surprise, if you think of it, right? But generally, how do you secure that laptop? How do you actually use zero trust-based model and policies to make sure once the laptop gets gets home, it's uh, it's in the uh, you know in the right shape all the time? So I think spending on security it depends on your. Uh, your exposure, the how you feel about uh, where you are. Um, and then, you, you know, maybe the folks who are spending slightly more, they may already have some solution in place, uh, examine what you got um, and make sure they're designed for a situation like what we're fa uh, facing today. Uh, basically work from anywhere is what, what I call, not necessarily from work from home. Work from home is very much COVID situation, but 
work from anywhere is likely uh, more like the case in the future. So I think, uh, you know, uh, less than before uh, we re reallocating funds, I would say, you know, those are cautious, definitely a kind of way to look at. And of course, I, I like the 40% majority saying, hey, ask the CISO. That's a very safe answer, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but generally, I believe uh, security spending is, uh, you know, from training your people uh, and maybe the solutions that you're uh, accustomed to right now uh, has a level of expense. Like Paul mentioned, the vendors are, there are a lot of vendors. You need to figure out which one is the right one, right fit for you. Um, sometimes uh, some folks who go straight to MSSP, they don't necessarily have to build their own team depending on the size of the organization. So I, I feel comfortable. These are very uh, real feedback answers. I, I feel like, you know, obviously uh, the COVID-19 made things more complicated by having endpoints out there uh, a lot more so than before. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you know, uh, having the right amount of security, starting from email, for example, from messaging, from application security, which touches on the infrastructure that, that's running the cloud uh, and CSPM, uh, uh, you know, cloud security posture management, configuration management, those things are uh, actually not too expensive. You just need to know how to uh, uh, get to it and start uh, using it. Yeah, that's pretty widely available out there. Yeah. Thanks so I'm me. encouraged. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to pick on that uh, topic yeah. on um, work from anywhere or hybrid working nowadays they were calling. Um, yeah. People, when, when COVID-19 started, a lot of people were looking at VPN as part of the network security because they had no choice. Right. The other choice was SD-WAN, but there were struggles, there were challenges. Could you uh, size up to me, what were the challenges with SD-WAN and what were the challenges that faced CISOs when they were looking at network security? Absolutely. So SD-WAN was, you know, if you think about uh, building a network that has uh, preferred traffic, uh, you know, patterns and, and quality assurance and guaranteed delivery of certain protocols and, and applications, it's not cheap because the internet was really crowded, right? And uh, if you're using internet routing, you're not always guaranteed the quality. So, uh, you know, there are various different solutions out there. Uh, uh, big telcos, you know, re you know, have circuits out there, MPOS circuits, various different things. VPN was good. VPN, I think there's two kinds of VPN, right? VPN to get into the infrastructure or a part of the infrastructure to, to access certain things. But think about VPN. It's a, uh, pretty heavy, you're getting a full, full IPv4 stack, depending on the network size you're getting. Uh, you could be very <laughs> exposed if the VPN credentials get stolen or something, you forgot to turn on uh, multi-factor uh, authentication, for example, it could be kind of dangerous. Uh, then if you think about the other VPNs, people using VPN to hide themselves, the bad guys that actually use VPN to, to, to navigate around the world and do bad things. So. So VPN was, I will say, contributes to uh, major growth in, you know, various different compute, uh, you know, hardware, everything. You know, it was, it's a good solution, but it's, to me, uh, I think it's a network segmentation, uh, not the best fit for the today and future, right? In the today and future, you're looking for SaaS application access control. Uh, you're looking for who has the data that, that goes in and out of Salesforce. And you want um, much more granular, uh, what we call the micro segmentation, where you're actually getting to the, uh, the apps level. So I think, uh, you know, on top of the VPN uh, component, if you think about SD1, it, SD1 was complicated, expensive, maybe you don't know where to start. Or how do you get started? You may have to get, you know, a lot of uh, uh, you know, try and trial and error and may not get where you want to go. So I think that the, the, it goes back to the beginning when I mentioned people start to look at public cloud sort of as the backbone of your network, right? So uh, one nice thing about Microsoft, they, they did something called Virtual One. Uh, a couple of years ago, they launched it and just to get a feeler out there. Hey, guess what? We can build the SD WAN for you uh, using the awesome Microsoft Azure uh, infrastructure of the world. So, but still, it wasn't 
easily attainable uh, in a sense where how do I get started, do it so I can get, uh, get my uh, uh, private data centers connected, my branch offices connected, my headquarters, maybe in the future, your manufacturing floor, as well as your uh, home offices, maybe, you know, if we get that far, right? So think about that. Uh, it requires a, a better solution, solution that is easier to attain and much, much uh, uh, less, I would say, less expensive compared to uh, the traditional solutions out there. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, SD-WAN security, and you, I know Barracuda has launched cloud-native SD-WAN. Could you explain a yep. bit more on that? I know we have read, written a small report on it, but it would be nice to hear. Yes, yes. This is really cool. This is a, a really good story. Uh, 2018 uh, Microsoft Ignite. Uh, I was out there looking at Microsoft's, you know, like Paul mentioned, there's a lot of security features in Azure. You know, how do you turn it on and off, make sure it's properly configured? Um, I, we created a product called Cloud Security Guardian. Uh, Cloud Security Guardian's job is to make sure, um, I, internal project uh, code name Guardian Angel. The reason it's called Guardian Angel is because my, my developers will do funny things and they, may, they, they make a mistake, right? They leave the, the port open. They forgot to add a security uh, group to, to, to protect the, the instance. So. Uh, Guardian Angel's job is to utilize those features. So 2018 night, Microsoft Azure launches uh, Azure Firewall. Uh, Cloud Security Guardian is the first CSPM that's able to automatically deploy a, 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 a Azure Firewall anywhere you need it. So that was kind of cool. You know, hey, we can orchestrate your cloud for you. Then suddenly, we, I had this moment with another, uh, uh, you know, head of network uh, uh, projects in Azure look, it would be cool if SD1 is done in a way people just go to the marketplace, you know, kind of like cloud native, go to the Azure marketplace here, here and say, bye, bye, then boom, here's the, uh, these are the branch offices we, we have, this is the size I need, right? And boom, then you can just get it, right? So, and, it, and the good news is we launched it last month. <laughs> so, so now you're able to do these things much more easier, more like a, the cloud, uh, you know, the, the nature of cloud, native scenario, like we described, developers are able to spin up databases, uh, uh, you know, compute resources, you know, various different things to help develop software, but security people should be able to, you know, build a SD-1 or infrastructure people should be able to build a SD-1, interconnect their offices and private data centers and other uh, clouds into, a, uh, uh, into Azure easily, and that way, uh, you, you know, make this uh, more attainable, more affordable for people. That's why uh, we went ahead and did this fun project together. Yeah. Do you want to show a quick slide on it? Or I, I'm sure yeah. you have already hit on all the points, but yeah, it'd be good to see. Yeah, absolutely. I promise, I, as you mentioned in the beginning, no less slides, I got me scared. I, uh, I will <laughs> just keep it maximum four. Okay, <laughs> I'll run through real quick. Do you guys see my screen? Give it around three, yes, three seconds before it. Yep. Okay, perfect. So this is what we call Azure Native Cloud Gen 1 from Barracuda. Applications spanning hybrid cloud. This is the first thing I wanted to touch on. Multi-cloud, public cloud and private cloud. And you don't necessarily have to only just have Azure or only have AWS. There are developers all over the world for you. Sometimes organizations have people working GCP, Azure, or maybe AWS, maybe Alibaba in China, in Asia, right? So multi-cloud is beyond just uh, public and private, but also multi-public cloud. Many applications may still use local resources like Oracle databases, uh, migrating to public cloud for database uses, uh, as well as application needs. Uh, multi-cloud connected via Barracuda Cloud Gen 1 is really what we wanted to actually picture. The reason I use database as example is because remember I mentioned, think about where your data lives, right? So a lot of, I mean, companies didn't just start when public cloud became available. People have applications running for many years uh, and perhaps even to the uh, uh, degree where the data center may already have a database that has, uh, you know, data for your application and, and it, 
it's not as easy as you think to move all that data into a public cloud. Some people may even have some some security questions before they move, right? So I, I like to use that example. So security on top of connectivity. So once you get that connectivity, you want to be able to apply security uh, very easily. So this is the solution we launched with Azure. Um, basically, if you look at what Azure offers is, you know, um, different VNets, different regions, uh, compute resources in various different sizes, different purposes, right? Uh, but remember, organizations don't actually physically live in the cloud. So they have branch offices, they have data centers, they have headquarters, some people, you know, work from home sometimes. So you got to have that connectivity together. So, so the idea here is we created uh, Barracuda's, um, what we called um, uh, Cloud Gen 1 has a component that lives inside the virtual hub uh, of, uh, of Azure's virtual one offering, which means you can literally choose uh, Barracuda uh, Cloud Gen 1. After that, uh, Azure automatically will deploy the components necessary to enable those VNets to connect to the branch offices. And how do you get the branch offices connect, uh, connected to, to, to Azure? Barracuda have uh, hundreds of thousands of customers using our product. They already have a next-gen firewall. This solution is built on top of that particular uh, product. Uh, it's called the Cloud GM1 um, you know, firewall, but it's actually the same product. It's designed to be more tailored to, to, con to have that connectivity, right? So the benefits are you know, just, I can list them all, but uh, definitely we'll share with you uh, later on, on uh, through email somehow. But deploy a SD1 networking uh, in fraction of the time compared to existing solutions. Scale up and down dynamically. These are really the native qualities and, and awesome qualities of public cloud, right? Quickly interconnect all branches and home offices. Remember, it's not just connecting from branch offices to, to Azure, but also connecting from branch offices to branch offices, right? Because that, that design is actually based on a, a, a proprietary protocol called TINA. Uh, Barracuda has, a, a, we call it the transport independent um, network architecture. So this, uh, this gives us the opportunity to go beyond just getting a, a VPN connection. We can actually orchestrate and manipulate the traffic so you can have security as well as quality assurance for uh, uh, for your traffic inside of this protocol. So, and this can be done today on our next gen firewall, but we made it available to the public cloud uh, users so they can literally uh, start from there and expand their network to their branch offices and interconnect everything together, right? So I won't go over all the benefits, but uh, definitely, like I mentioned, you know, down the bottom, you can see extend the one to Microsoft Azure seamlessly, very easy. So you can now have your compute resources in Azure, but your database could be still in a data center. You can have that uh, connect connection. Your application will still function. Even you haven't had the time to migrate your database into the public cloud yet, right? So using that example. Also enjoy optimized Office 365 experience. That This is cool because we know how to uh, identify Office 365 traffic on the fly and be able to local break out the traffic. So it doesn't have to uh, go through a concentrator, like VPN concentrator is one of the biggest challenges, right? You get your IP, all, all that um, IP set going in, uh, eventually you're concentrating from one area, then you go to the actual SaaS, which is super inefficient. With this, we can actually say, this is a traffic you're allowed to have directly from your internet provider, so we don't have to actually uh, haul the traffic back, right? So anyway, so this is uh, lots of benefits. Uh, then the next one, I wanted to just kind of run through how easy it is. So my, my drawing is not the best, but there's a user, uh, you may have some VNets, you have maybe using Azure, you have some, you have some offices and you have a headquarter and private data center. So first step, you go to the marketplace, Azure Marketplace, create Azure Virtual One. It's, it's super easy, um, very much cloud native kind of uh, 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 acquisition style. You, you put in the shopping cart, basically. You subscribe to it. Second, you subscri subscribe to the Barracuda SD-WAN. Then after that, um, through that process, 
we will identify where you need the, the Barracuda Car Gen 1 uh, basically gateways that sits at, at your office. It can be virtual, so I made it look like a cloud on top of a box, but you can also have physical, right? Physical or virtual, we can basically be able to deploy and allow you to actually get ready for the configuration you need. And this green wavy lines coming from uh, the basically virtual one, so this, uh, this globe with the you know, cloud, that's basically Azure uh, virtual one. So from there, we do some uh, configuration exchange to make sure we are able to sync and you know, through our zero touch service, you literally get the boxes into the building and immediately a handshake and uh, automatically come online. And after that, uh, basically all those orange uh, you know, path are the path that you are uh, interconnecting into Azure VNets through your uh, headquarter or your data centers or your branch offices. And don't forget, we also allow you to easily interconnect between your branch offices so they can have uh, you know, network connectivity uh, without going to Azure. This is basically done in a very uh, 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 comprehensive manner. So it's a full mesh. So basically one, two, three, four, five, basically you can get this going way better than any solution in the past. So this is the nice thing about working with Microsoft, have that ability to build into Azure a function that Barracuda provides uh, and makes it super easy for people to uh, obtain, right? Hopefully that wasn't too long and that's it. I, I will not Thank share any more slides. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Fleming. I think, I think that's quite concise and don't worry. Uh, I think a lot of artists join IT. I mean, a lot of people who join IT are not really good artists. That's good. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'd like to widen up the uh, discussion a bit. And that was a topic that both Paul alluded to and Fleming mentioned, and that was the trust-based security. Uh, maybe I would like to ask Paul at this time, what is trust-based security from your perspective? And do you see a rise in that concept? Yeah, yeah, th thanks. And um, yeah, so, so trust-based trust security and, and there's different flavors of it, um, zero trust or partial trust, whatever. I mean, trust, trust has been around in the security world for, for a few years. I mean, I, I remember at least 20 years ago, there was trust, trust models and um, for public key infrastructures uh, in my days when I was working at Visa MasterCard. So, so trust has been around for, uh, for a while. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a, you know, the industry's talking about it uh, last couple of years. And, you know, for me, it's, it's, I mean, it's necessary to innovate and have new, new models. Um, it's much like cloud was a few years ago, it came along and everybody wondered what this thing was. And um, as it slowly comes along and you know, matures. Um, I think it holds good, good promise, right? But like, like I, I was saying a bit earlier that, you know, you have this move when you're securing um, assets, it's moved away from infrastructure to apps and right up to the data layer. So when you're in looking at securing data, you need to know where it is and, and, and where it flows. And that's kind of one of the, uh, you know, under, underlying pillars for trust-based security. So, so that's, um, you know, one of them. And then like, like we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, before Fleming was mentioning the uh, you know, identity and access management, um, multi-factor authentication. So you're controlling who's got access to the data. Um, and then you, you, you have this overall kind of like trust, trust model. So, um, and then, you know, you, you have the, you know, I, I guess on the infrastructure level, um, most of the clients, at least here in Singapore, you know, they're, they're, they're not fully on public cloud, you know, unless they're, they're FinTech or, uh, you know, they're born in the cloud. So, so there are some, you know, um, for sure, the transportation companies, you know, uh, some of them that, you know, the challengers, um, but the major majority are, are, you know, in this hybrid world. So there's, there's, you know, on-prem and they're, and they're on a multi-cloud using, you know, two or three of the, you know, SaaS applications, you know, plus, plus one of the big clouds, one or two of the big cloud service providers, you know, typically. So you kind of got this, you know, big industry trend coming along. Um, I, I think we've seen wide scale adoption in, in Singapore, L lots of discussions the past few uh, panels and conferences, there'd be a lot of discussion to, to, to sort of trying to find what it is, how it can be useful. Um, I think ultimately like with any new trend, it's, it's like on the radar and you've got to be uh, looking to see how it can best fit your organization. Uh, and for CISOs, that means incorporating it in their, you know, strategy and roadmap. Um, you know, I think the other thing we see a lot of, you know, on the ground is, you know, the organizations are still trying to uh, fix their network segmentation. So this, this provides some, 
opportunities perhaps to sort of leapfrog and sort out some of the, the network segmentation issues that you know a lot of organizations are, are, are working on. And of course they're interested in that to, to try and minimize the, the impacts of uh, lateral movement when an attacker gets in, like we were talking about with you know the phishing. Uh, if you've got a flat network, uh, obviously you, uh, the ability to to move around and uh, you know cause cause more damage is uh, is increased in that situation. So I think some of these software defined you know models, you know software defined uh, networks uh, can can potentially help you know uh, build on this sort of a uh, you know trust based uh, model. Thank you, Paul. And I'd like to uh, ask um, everyone, if you have any other questions, because this is a conversation, we do not want it to be a bylog or a monologue. And um, please do post any of these questions. Um, but I'd just like to uh, shift to Fleming, who would have recovered from the presentation that he gave us, which was <laughs> really quite exciting. Uh, Paul mentioned about trust-based security as a concept. From your perspective, when you're talking to clients, what's stopping trust-based security? Is it the timing or is it people, CISOs looking at it to see whether it needs to become more mature or are there components on trust-based security that is still overlooked or there are gaps? Yeah, um, as Paul mentioned, right, there's been a few years of different kind of definitions for zero trust. So zero trust as SDP, software defined parameter, it's an awesome concept. Right. We, I don't, you, if you think about it, a lot of global companies, they may have uh, a designer, you know, a chip designer in Taiwan, but they have maybe uh, an architect in San Diego, right? I can't, I, you can almost guess which company you're th I'm talking about now. That could basically, uh, you know, how do you get them to work together on a project? And when the project is done, you make, sh make sure you wipe out that environment. So it's overlay. So that's one. Second, zero trust also came along a couple of years ago, confused a lot of more people because zero trust was all about what we call the rehydration. You build your environment, you have automation in place. Every 30 days, you completely wipe out your environment, you restart. So you have no trust to any of those workloads being 100% clean. <laughs> okay, that's, that's also being talked about. But pandemic really kind of made it very, very prevalent in a sense, zero trust really means, really means trust-based uh, policy architecture, which is uh, security architecture, because it's about what condition the person or the device that's accessing your resource is in before you grant that access. So that requires multi-factor, uh, all kinds of check and balance to make sure, and also contextual data, like are you on a Wi-Fi that is not, uh, not secure, or maybe it's a public Wi-Fi. Uh, are you in a geolocation that's prone to attacks? For example, maybe um, internet cafes, if, if those things still exist. But I know people, you know, going in the environment could do bad things. So point there is that um, I believe what's holding people back is, is still trying to figure out what does zero trust mean to them? Well, for is it my application uh, environment, you know, in the sense, in the, in the concept of uh, rehydration, right? Um, uh, and is it my global workforce, um, you know, that needs to have shared compute and shared resources? Or is it related to my resources being, data being accessed by people and need to make sure they're who they say they are, right? So generally, I think um, it's about to go pretty broadly, I think will grow this particular sector because I feel like people are starting to figure it out. And the pandemic is helping people to make that decision. Uh, they need to quickly, uh, uh, to, you know, come up with a solution so, so they don't leave their uh, infrastructure uh, exposed, um, you know, without a, a more modernized uh, architecture. Yeah, security architecture. Thank you. And Paul, um, quick one to you. Are we feeling hydrated or rehydrated these days? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <man. laughs> as as, as um, uh, Fleming was mentioning about rehydration, the concept, uh, what's stopping? Uh, and you, I think you alluded to some of the points earlier in your statement, but I'm just wondering to pick on the point on what is really stopping from people from your conversation with CISOs. Yeah, so, so I think, um, I think there's, uh, you know, there's, there's definite opportunities there. Um, so I think uh, maybe what's stopping is, is, is more around just the, you know, some of the priorities that they've, that they've got. So they're, they're still, 
you know, securing some of the legacy network infrastructure, extending their, their VPNs, you know, so they're doing maybe some of the less sexy stuff, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. probably, you know, they build audit points or regulators for uh, particularly yeah. in Singapore where they need to fix up. They're maybe, maybe still fixing up some patching or, or this, you know, all these, these things that's on a CISO's plate. So, so I think, um, you know, and, and that's maybe just a Singapore perspective. Um, but I think equally there's, there's an eye on innovation. And like I was saying, you know, being able to, you know, leapfrog using some of these new trust models, you know, and, and the software defined technologies, there's, there's definite opportunity there. Um, but if you think really just, you know, in the, even in Singapore here with the, you know, the move to the, to the public cloud, um, you know, a lot of the regulated, uh, you know, uh, sectors is, you know, they're, it's a slow move, right? So the, um, the, the, some of them are on for their non-critical workloads, but they're, they're still, uh, doing that and that's for, for cloud that's been around for, for so many years right um, when I worked in the US you know uh, much further ahead uh, you know at least in that in that respect so I think there's a combination of these factors but I think we'll see it uh, it will definitely take off you know uh, as we start to emerge from COVID and um, I think like Fleming has said where there's some uh, leaders or, or uh, you know CIOs CTOs that are you know making uh, long-term decisions for which direction their architecture is going um, now they've got a bit of a breather, maybe from from fixing up some of the legacy, um, making those architectural decisions and committing to to this uh, uh, your way forward. So I think that's. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just a quick one, and I know we have one to two minutes. Uh, okay. Michael Johnson actually uh, asked, and the idea is, can someone comment on whether data on the cloud uh, and the available controls is increasing or reducing our security risk? versus legacy on-premise uh, approaches. Maybe I'll throw it to uh, Paul and then I'll leave to Fleming to oh, actually yeah. add to that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, I'll, I'll do a quick one. So I think um, it depends on the size of your, your organization. I think I'd always say if, if you're more small, medium enterprise and running your own servers, then you know, the, the cloud service providers are gonna be securing things you know, better because it's their business and you know, it'll be an uplift in security for sure. You, you still have you know, your own um, you know, your own responsibilities to secure. So if you're doing infrastructure as a service, you know, you've still got to patch, uh, all that type of thing. Um, so it's not just a, you know, it's an outsourcing, but it's, it's you know, you still have responsibilities um, there. I think, you know, at the top end, uh, bigger organizations, there's definitely uh, banks going, but they're, they're prioritizing their workloads um, into the different criticalities. Um, so not often putting the, the critical crown jewels uh, there, but maybe putting some more middle or back office, um, you know, systems, systems there. Um, and it's part of a, you know, multi-year journey. Um, and, you know, for the data security side of things, then, you know, data security still remains a, a responsibility of, of, of the, you know, the corporate. So need to, need to be able to, um, you know, provide that and, and do the tools. What's happening in the cloud provider side, they're providing a lot of the tools. So there's, there's so many things that are available. So it's important to understand what's available native there um, and work out if it's good enough for you. And if not, then you might need to, to you know, integrate a, a third party tool uh, in your architecture as well. Uh, but there's certainly plenty of, of tools in that, uh, in that space for, for whatever you decide to move. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. And Fleming, quick one. Uh, yes, one to two points here. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, public cloud is definitely very mature in terms of security on the infrastructure. So they actually do a better job than the people who are building data centers privately. They're, they have done an awesome job. Second point, so it's more secure on infrastructure and, and physical. Second point is they have the features. You need to have something like a CSPM to use, utilize those features correctly because the people who are touching the infrastructure is no longer just security or network people, developers and developers, a lot of them. And they do, they sometimes make mistakes. Thank you. We are mm -hmm. all humans, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So with something like a CSPM uh, solution can make sure it's properly uh, utilized, the, the cloud is properly utilized, then you will be far off, far better than if you try to do it yourself. Yeah. So at this moment, I'll say thank you, Fleming, and thank you, Paul. Uh